Remote, wild, frigid, and vast, Antarctica, also known as the White Continent, is one of the most sensational and unique ecosystems on Earth. Beneath the ice and snow, Antarctica hides the enigmatic remnants of ancient civilizations, their awe-inspiring architectural marvels, and the mysteries that continue to puzzle archaeologists and historians. And in a world-shattering revelation, a former naval officer and a journalist have shared shocking stories on how they discovered an entrance to a secret alien base containing UFOs in Antarctica. This groundbreaking revelation promises to rewrite history as we know it and unlocks a treasure trove of mysteries frozen in time. But how did they this secret alien base? How did the nation's leaders try to hide it from the whole world? What would happen if we actually found extraterrestrial life on Earth? Join us on a journey to unlock the mysteries that these ancient structures conceal, where the realms of history and wonder merge and the past reveals its hidden treasures. Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, and driest continent. It contains 90% of all of the ice on Earth in an area just under 1.5 times the size of the United States but the southernmost continent is much more than a big block of ice. Lying in the Antarctic Circle that rings the southern part of the globe, Antarctica is the fifth largest continent. Its size varies through the seasons as expanding sea ice along the coast nearly doubles the continent's size in the winter. Almost all of Antarctica is covered with ice. Less than half a percent of the vast wilderness is ice-free. Despite all its ice, Antarctica is classified as a desert because so little moisture falls from the sky. The inner regions of the continent receive an average of two inches of precipitation, primarily in the form of snow, each year. To put that into perspective, much of the Sahara Desert gets twice as much rain each year. The coastal regions of Antarctica receive more falling moisture, but still average only eight inches annually. However, unlike most desert regions, the moisture doesn't soak into the ground. Instead, the snow piles on top of itself. Although little moisture falls from the sky, Antarctica is still battered by colossal blizzards. Like sandstorms in the desert, the wind picks snow up from the ground and blows vast white blankets. Winds can reach up to 200 miles per hour. Because it lies in the southern hemisphere, seasons in Antarctica are the opposite of seasons in the north. Summer runs from October to February, and winter covers the remainder of the year. Antarctic summers average just above freezing, with the more mountainous East Antarctica colder than its western counterpart. The lowest temperature in the world, minus 89.6 degrees Celsius, was recorded at Vostok Station, a Russian research station in inland Antarctica. Under such harsh weather, it is understandable that Antarctica has never had an indigenous human population, apart from there being no land bridge or other obvious points of transit for prehistoric humans. The last time that Antarctica was habitable without the aid of modern technology, that is to say, had a climate that early humans could have considered remotely temperate or survivable, was at least 35 million years ago. Granted, at that time, and for many millions of years prior, Antarctica was downright balmy, an ancient rainforest that would be hard to envision on the dry, ice-swept land that we know today. However, considering that Homo sapiens weren't around until about 350,000 years ago, and that one of our closest ancestors, Homo erectus, dates back only to about 2 million years, it is implausible, to put it mildly, to suggest that any human-like creature could have reached, let alone survived, Antarctica back in the day. In fact, humans didn't even conceive of a giant landmass at the bottom of the planet until about 350 BC, when the Greeks, specifically Aristotle, were among the earliest recorded Western minds to theorize the existence of the continent of Antarctica, or Antarcticos, as they called it. Admittedly, they didn't have proof that it really was there, nor did they go looking for it, let alone try to inhabit it. Compelling evidence has suggested that humans first encountered Antarctica 
around 600 AD, when Polynesian people likely stumbled upon the icy continent. These findings are based on a careful study of the oral histories of the Maori and other related cultures, which describe encounters with a land to the south that probably was Antarctica. Europeans came along several hundred years later with explorers from many nations, the great Captain Cook among them, searching for, but never quite finding, the actual Antarctic mainland. Antarctica's discovery is usually noted as occurring around 1820, although even the history books cannot agree on who precisely spotted the continent first. The first reported landing on Antarctica came in 1821 when an intrepid sea captain named John Davis claimed to have put his crew ashore briefly to hunt for seals. By the late 1890s, other better documented landings had occurred and ships began to spend the winter, often involuntarily, on Antarctic ice. Humans have been a presence of one kind or another in the region ever since. In short order, the so-called heroic age of Antarctic exploration was underway, with daring adventurers and scientists embarking on punishing and sometimes fatal expeditions onto the continent at the dawn of the 20th century. One of the earliest bases in the region was established in 1903 on Laurie Island and is the oldest such outpost still in operation. It wasn't until 1944 that the first long-term mainland bases were established. With more scientific bases and more scientific cooperation between nations following in the 1950s. In the decades since, scientists have discovered amazing things on and below the Antarctic ice. More than 45,000 meteorites, including rocks that came from the moon and even Mars, secret ecosystems teeming with unexpected creatures, stunningly durable plant life that can live beneath the ice with almost no light, and much more. This includes archaeological endeavors. Entire books have been written on Antarctic archaeology, mainly in pursuit of the study and conservation of late 19th and 20th century artifacts from the heroic age. Such research includes the study and preservation of early sealing and whaling stations, huts established in support of Robert Falcon Scott's multiple and ultimately ill-fated expeditions to penetrate to the center of Antarctica the last resting place of the Endurance, the famous ship lost during the 1914-15 expedition of Sir Ernest Shackleton, and even the exploration of mid-century ghost stations long abandoned by earlier researchers and explorers. With such a rich history, this vast, icy expanse has captivated the imaginations of explorers, scientists, and conspiracy theorists alike, offering a canvas for some of the most intriguing and unexplained mysteries of our time. This isolation has spurred countless theories about what lies beneath the surface, from ancient artifacts of lost civilizations to evidence of alien visitation and hidden military installations. Suspicions were raised more and more when a former naval officer and a journalist have shared shocking stories on how they discovered an entrance to a secret alien base containing UFOs in Antarctica. In 2018, Linda Moulton Howe interviewed a whistleblower who, under the condition of anonymity, provided classified information regarding Antarctica. The source, a retired Navy SEAL identified as Spartan One, shared details of an ancient structure he claims to have visited during his time at the South Pole. The retired Navy SEAL said, At that time, his rank was First Lieutenant Commander Naval Special Operations. He and his team were inbound the southeast coast of Antarctica we were dispatched for, unofficially, was a research reconnaissance mission. Officially, it was to find a certain individual obtaining any information and bring it back. But when he and his team reached their destination, they encountered a large octagonal structure protruding from the ice. Cautiously, they proceeded to enter it. According to Spartan One, at the very top of the first structure they entered, almost 18 feet poked from the ice, with the rest hidden beneath. Each door was consistent, ranging from 18 feet thick to around 30 feet. Surprisingly, despite their thickness and weight, these doors could be opened with minimal effort, a single finger push, and they would open without any resistance. Facing an outside temperature of at least 40 degrees below zero, stepping inside revealed a stark contrast. 
the interior maintained an ambient temperature of 68 to 72 degrees. The mystery deepened as they explored the interiors. Ceilings, hallways, and floors were all aglow in a lime green light, yet the source remained elusive. The walls were lined with what Spartan one described as hieroglyphics, although unlike any he had ever seen before. This begs the question, are the mysterious structures buried in Antarctica, constructed by an advanced civilization beyond Earth in our remote past? Thing just got weird as satellites probing the surface of Antarctica captured a bunch of images of more caverns in the snow. Many people believe that could be secret bases where UFOs go after they patrol our skies during the night and disappear before the dawning of light. But have these aliens been our residents for centuries? Are they watching our human ancestries? Conspiracy theories spread like wildfire as the internet was flooded with reports that Antarctica was shut down by the US after drones captured what no one was supposed to see in January 2015. UFO hunters believe that the strange objects could be a piece of evidence indicating the existence of extraterrestrial on Earth. So, the US government's action to close Antarctica is like adding fuel to the fire, making conspiracy theorists believe that the government is keeping details secret. Another stunning discovery, while it may seem unthinkable that pyramids could exist in Antarctica, in recent years, archaeologists have found pyramids all over the world that had been lost for centuries, mistaken as natural formations or hidden in the most unlikely places. They have been discovered in the plains of northern Peru, buried beneath dirt and rubble in Indonesia, and one may even exist in Los Angeles, California. All around the world, evidence of pyramid structures emerges. Should we start looking at the possibility that there was habitation on Antarctica? Was it a lost civilization, ancient astronauts, or just maybe the earliest monuments of our own civilization that originally came from Antarctica? If this titanic pyramid in Antarctica is an artificial structure, it would probably be the oldest pyramid on our planet. In fact, it might be the master pyramid that all the other pyramids on Earth were designed to look like. Extensive research has been conducted on pyramids throughout the world regarding their structure and their true nature. One theory suggests that pyramids are power generators. If strategically placed around the world, generating this charge, it's possible to create a general standing wave, a wireless transmission of energy, around the world. It's been theorized that ancient ships, extraterrestrials, and those with high technology could use this interconnected wireless energy system to navigate around the planet. It makes sense that if there was some kind of worldwide pyramid power grid like this, Antarctica would have pyramids as well. The whole idea of these pyramidal structures, where did it come from? It's not an arbitrary thing, and these structures exist worldwide. So, what was the impetus? What's the origin? And even more fascinating, did they originate on the Antarctic continent? Might the pyramid photographed in Antarctica provide evidence of extraterrestrial visitation to our planet in the remote past? And if they are actually man-made structures, how is such a thing even possible in a place that has been buried beneath the ice for over 12 million years? According to ancient astronaut theorists, Antarctica may not have been a frozen continent for as long as mainstream scientists suggest. They say proof can be found by examining a 500-year-old map depicting the continent without any ice. Tension increased as several alien-like organisms have been found thriving on a boulder far below Antarctica's ice shelf, in one of the planet's most extreme environments where food, heat, and sunlight are almost non-existent. A team of geologists stumbled upon the colony of sponge-like life forms and animals while drilling for sediment cores beneath the Filchner Rana ice shelf, according to their findings published in the Frontiers in Marine Science Journal. They had no intention of looking for life, but they found it through a pure fluke. Rock hunters with the British Antarctic Survey cut through 870 meters of ice to get to the water far below, then tried to plunge a drill into the seafloor when they struck a boulder instead. 
Scientists dropped a GoPro camera down the hole to investigate the obstruction and were shocked when they pulled it back up to review the footage. In the video, the GoPro camera falls through the hole and clanks off a boulder before settling on the seafloor with its lens pointed up. The camera is tilted enough to reveal several moss-like organisms and tiny animals growing under the rock, including some with long stalks that wave in the blackness below the ice. Researchers counted 16 sponges and at least 22 unidentified animals on the rock. The scientists were stunned to find anything alive in the extreme environment below the ice shelf, where conditions are even more unforgiving than in the pitch-black depths of oceans in warmer parts of the world. According to marine biologist and lead study author Hugh Griffiths of the British Antarctic Survey, there's all sorts of reasons they shouldn't be there. It's slightly bonkers. Never in a million years would we have thought about looking for this kind of life because we didn't think it would be there. Deep ocean creatures survive by feeding on each other, on swirling plankton or on dead plants and animals that fall down from the more well-lit layers of the water column. However, conditions are much more bleak under the ice shelf, where there are few life forms to deliver scavenger meals to the layers below. Nevertheless, the life forms on the rock somehow managed to survive with over one kilometer of ice and nearly empty water overhead. The nearest open water is 260 kilometers away, although food would have had to come from an even greater distance based on the direction of underwater currents. Griffith says the organisms are likely filter feeders that capture tiny bits of organic material from the water. Their mere existence suggests that underwater currents can sweep food across distances that scientists once thought impossible. That's also why Griffiths concludes, this isn't some graveyard where a few things cling on. It's more complicated than we thought. The study authors plan to examine the area in more detail in the future, as there might be some never before seen species living in the depths below the ice. As Griffiths said, it was a real shock to find them there. But we can't do DNA tests. We can't work out what they've been eating or how old they are. We don't even know if they are new species, but they're definitely living in a place where we wouldn't expect them to be living. After all, we just need more data. Each such a discovery has brought surprises and forced us to expand our notion of what is biologically possible. As more terrestrial environments are explored, it seems very likely that new and ever more exotic forms of life will be discovered. If this search were to uncover evidence for a second genesis, it would strongly support the theory that life is a cosmic phenomenon and lend credence to the belief that we are not alone in the universe. On the other hand, the search for signs of alien beyond Earth life involves a variety of efforts, from the Perseverance rover collecting samples of Martian rocks to space telescopes peering at the atmospheres of distant exoplanets. It also includes the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, also known as SETI. Most SETI projects are focused on looking for artificial or unusual signals coming from elsewhere in the cosmos that might have been broadcast by technologically advanced life forms. Others involve sending out our own signals, showing that intelligent life exists here on Earth. And the potential implications of contact with an advanced alien species drives discussions not only based on science, but also ethics and policy. With billions of trillions of planets and moons in the universe, it's very unlikely that Earth is the only home to intelligent life. So how do we go about looking for evidence of our cosmic peers? Although many species on Earth are considered intelligent, dolphins, octopuses, and chimpanzees, for example, their sentience wouldn't be detectable from afar. In the context of SETI, Intelligence can only be identified by its outputs, technologies, industrial processes, communications methods, and so on. Much of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is based on the outputs that human intelligence creates, since those are the signs of technological advancement that we know best. Although alien civilizations could have super advanced technologies beyond our wildest dreams, it's also very likely that some things are universal. Electromagnetic communication is one such thing. 
Humans use electromagnetic radiation to transmit information. From cell phones to television broadcasts, lasers to radar astronomy, our ability to use technology to manipulate the electromagnetic spectrum has served us very well as a species. We might assume, then, that other intelligent life forms would also have found this aspect of physics useful as well. For this reason, that much of SETI research involves scanning space for electromagnetic signals to try to identify patterns or transmissions that couldn't be explained by natural phenomena. This includes listening for radio signals as well as looking for transmissions in the visible range of the electromagnetic spectrum, such as pulses of light. SETI is a large-scale effort that requires extensive collaboration. For instance, one planetary society-funded project involves searching a wide range of radio frequencies using the world's largest steerable radio telescope, the 100-meter Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Their observations focus on 100 stars known to have planets around them, and due to the width of the radio telescope field of view, they pick up tens of thousands of additional stars and planetary systems. Citizen scientists from around the world then step in to help classify signals in the data to sort out the many sources of radio signals produced by intelligent life here on Earth and highlight the most promising signals in the data. Finally, professional SETI researchers revisit those promising signals to assess their potential as signs of intelligent life. All of this takes hundreds of hours and yet only represents a search of a tiny portion of space. The scale of the universe makes the scope of SETI truly immense, which may be one reason why, so far, we haven't found what we're looking for. If intelligent aliens are out there, it's fairly likely that they're also conducting their own version of SETI. We are as likely to be detected by a civilization as advanced as our own as we are to detect them. The signals that are most likely to be picked up by other life forms are those we send out deliberately for this purpose. All electromagnetic communication travels at the speed of light, but some signals make it farther than others, decreasing in intensity as they get farther from their source. The distance a transmission can reach depends on several factors, including the power of the transmitter and the frequency of the signal. It's a common science fiction idea that far-off aliens might pick up our stray television transmissions, but this isn't likely to happen. Television signals are broadcast using fairly weak transmitters since they aren't intended to go very far. The earliest television broadcasts have likely traveled beyond our solar system by now, but they're exceedingly weak by the time they reach interstellar space and would be practically indistinguishable from the background noise of the universe. Some of our radar signals are likely to travel farther. Missile detection radar uses very strong transmitters, as do planetary radar systems like the now-defunct Arecibo Observatory, which used to use radar to detect near-Earth asteroids and other distant objects. It's possible that intelligent aliens could pick up those radar signals and identify them as being of technological origin, provided those aliens weren't much farther than the closest neighboring star system. Humans have intentionally sent several strong signals into space with the intention of having them detected by extraterrestrial civilizations. These efforts are called METI, Messaging to Extraterrestrial Intelligence, CT, communication with extraterrestrial intelligence, messages, or forward active SETI. The Arecibo message was one of the earliest and most famous METI attempts. A message was transmitted in 1974 from the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico toward the M13 star cluster, including a binary encoded image that conveyed basic information about Earth and humanity. Similarly, the Encounter 2001 project sent a message about our species and planet from the European Space Agency's ISCAT radar transmitter in Norway toward the North Star Polaris. The message also included a specific set of messages and images from teenagers from around the world. The Cosmic Call project sent two messages, one in 1999 and one in 2003, 
to nearby star systems using the RT-70 radio telescope in Ukraine. These messages included mathematical and scientific content, as well as artistic elements. In 2013, the Lone Signal Project invited the public to participate, collecting text messages to be sent in the direction of the Gliese 526 star system using the Jamesburg Earth Station radio dish in California. Humans have also sent physical messages into space aboard spacecraft destined to travel far beyond our solar system. NASA's Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 spacecraft, both launched in the early 1970s, each carries a gold anodized aluminum plaque with information about Earth's location and the spacecraft's origin. After passing through the solar system to study the outer planets, these spacecraft carried on away from our sun, meaning they could potentially travel through interstellar space forever, or perhaps until intercepted by another spacefaring species. NASA's follow-up Voyager mission took the concept a step further. The Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 spacecraft each carried a gold-plated phonograph record known as the Voyager Golden Record. These records were encoded with a wide variety of sounds and images representing Earth, including greetings in 55 languages, music, and scientific information. Because they reached greater speeds than the Pioneer spacecraft, the Voyager probes are now farther from the Sun, already in interstellar space. But after all, is contacting aliens a good idea? In fact, the act of sending deliberate signals into space has generated debate within the scientific and ethical communities. One concern is that a very small group of people, sometimes just a few individuals, are given the responsibility of representing our entire species and planet. The inherent unfairness of this is considered a problem by some ethicists. Another issue with METI is that we cannot possibly know the nature or intentions of an alien species that might find our signals. While it's possible that we'd be discovered by a benevolent advanced extraterrestrial civilization that could share secrets of interstellar travel, power generation, or any other world-changing technologies, it's also possible that we'd be found by a civilization intent on conquering the galaxy and eradicating the existing creatures on life-sustaining planets. Because we can't know the outcome of successful contact with intelligent extraterrestrial beings, some scientists are against METI, and there are space policy experts who have suggested that investing money and effort into METI efforts is unwise. However, ultimately, it's possible that we'll be discovered by aliens looking for life beyond their own planet, whether we try or not. The possibility of life's existence elsewhere in the universe is one of the fundamental and unanswered mysteries about our reality, and it may not be up to us whether we solve that mystery. So let's say it actually happens. We uncover or are approached by alien life. Now what? How does the public react? Do our defensive instincts or humble curiosities take over? A research suggests that the general population's reaction would be quite positive. The first study used software to analyze the text of various newspaper articles written about three potential discoveries of life beyond Earth. The software assessed the feelings, emotions, and other psychological reactions conveyed in articles about the following discoveries. Possible fossilized extraterrestrial microbes in 1996, intermittent dimming around Tabby's star in 2015, and Earth-like exoplanets in the habitable zone of a star in 2017. The study found that the language used in these articles was overwhelmingly positive. In a second study, the researchers asked over 500 participants to write down how they think they, as well as the rest of the world, would react to a confirmed case of extraterrestrial microbial life. It found that the emotions used to describe both their own and the population's hypothetical reactions were substantially more positive than negative. A third study gathered 500 additional participants and divided them into two groups. Each group was asked to write down their reaction to an article in the New York Times about a previous scientific discovery. 
One group was shown an article about synthetic human life allegedly being developed in a lab, and the other, an article about a Mars meteorite containing signs of ancient microbial life. The emotional reactions to both articles were significantly more positive than negative in this study, particularly in the case of the discovery of microbial life. Taken together, this suggests if we find out we're not alone, we'll take the news rather well. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.